All right, guys. Good study this week, huh? You know, it wasn't uh, a couple weeks ago when we were asking the question, are we there yet? Are we there yet? This week we've got a shift and say the question is, now what? Now what? You know, just for a little backdrop, uh, we started first week, we had these, these theme uh, verses in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Where Paul introduced to this to the Christians in Rome, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. He says, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We got that introduction, you know, and then we plunged down into the wrath of God. And we talked about specifically, it's not that God's storing up a bunch of wrath, it's that we store it up for ourselves. And Paul did a really good job of addressing every one of us in here and every other person on the planet to conclude in chapter 3, verse 20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. No one. We got to that point. We said, are we there yet? Are we all there to the point of getting on our knees and admitting to God that we need a Savior? And then you had this awesome transition to the very next verse, chapter 3, verse 21, when Paul said, but now, but now. And explain to us in the last three weeks about righteousness through faith, how we go from eternally lost in our sin at odds with God to a right relationship with him by faith through his amazing grace. Now, Paul is turning his attention to what comes after justification by faith. You know, we've been, we've been pulled out of the ocean, pulled out of the fire, so glad I'm not there anymore. Now what? What does this grace mean in my life now that we've received it? And, and so it's really, it's not where the story ends, pulling us out of the fire, but really it's where the story begins for us today, right? Tomorrow we're all going to wake up, and I hope and pray that each one of you has turned your life over to Christ, and so now you're in a right relationship with God. So now you wake up tomorrow and say, what does this mean? What does this grace mean in my life? How am I going to live it out right now? Uh, so it's really where the story begins now, where we are. And, and, you, and you, you might, you bear it out, here's a, here's a question to, to lead us to this point. And that is, what in, in your opinion, what's the best emotion that a person can experience? You can think of joy, love, accomplishment, you think of all times, all types of great emotions. But I'm going to submit to you one as, that is, is better, and we've all experienced it in many ways, and that's relief. Relief. You think about it. With the crisis of God's wrath resolved through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the righteousness of God that we've received through faith, the believers... All right, we have this great relief. We've been pulled out of the fire. And now we've got to come to terms with living with this great relief. And before we skip over that thought and think, oh, it's really easy, you know, we need to think, just pause for a moment because it's really not. It's an awesome thing to figure out in our life, this relief, how do we live with this peace with God that we have now? And, and, and we know it's not just a simple thing because now Paul basically spends the rest of this letter discussing this very thing. And, and you look at these 11 verses uh, of, the, of chapter 5 and, and trying to, to quantify, you know, what are they about? And, and Paul covers so much as he's been doing lately. You, you know, he covers peace with God. He covers reconciliation, access to grace. Hope in the glory of God. Hope in our eternal salvation. You know, joy in suffering. We're looking at God's love for us. 
You understand why one author uh, titled these 11 verses the blessings of salvation, the blessings of justification. But one particular topic, you know, continues to emerge, I think, maybe as the, the unifying focus, and that is our hope for final salvation, is there can be no greater relief than to know the hope and security that we have in our final salvation. And we look at these, uh, these three divisions tonight, I've divided them up into three, one through four, five through eight, and nine through eleven. Um, go ahead and go to this first division, and, and I and I uh, and by the way, I am open to any tips that you guys ever want to give me on how I do this and how we present things. And I thought it'd be good to go ahead and put the principle up here, so you're not trying to catch it when I'm saying it. Moving on to the next division, uh, so let's dive in here. We're in the, in the first division, one through four. I call peace as believers. Through this first phrase, he says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, you know, Paul is signaling this transition. He's been talking about how do we get justified. It's through faith. And he says, now, he switches, say, therefore, since we have been justified. So we know we're moving into a new chapter here. He's established the truth of justification by faith through the last four chapters. So now he's going to elaborate on this new status that we enjoy now that we have been justified. And one of the first results, he says, is peace with God. So since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's worth stopping and reading that again. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. You know, peace with God, those three words, there's probably no more relief than you can get than those three words, peace with God. And you look at the word uh, peace in English and in the, in the secular Greek language, it has a little more of a negative sense. It's kind of just the ab peace of the absence of hostility. Okay, there's no war going on. But in the Old Testament, in the, the Jewish word for peace was shalom had a much more positive connotation. It, it meant a general sense of harmonious well-being. And, and I'll read a couple of verses from Isaiah 32 that really explain this, this idea of this shalom peace. It says, The fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. This peace is the real state of harmony with God that we enjoy now that we have been justified. And here's a great place really where, where the rubber can meet the road on this. And we talked about this in a leaders meeting on Saturday morning. You guys, there was reference in the lesson to Ephesians 3.12. Paul says, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Well, what, does that, what does that look like, approaching God with freedom and confidence now that we're, we have this peace with God? And if somebody said, and I know I'm guilty of it thousands of times over, when we, when we do something wrong, when we, when we sin, we say something wrong, think something wrong, how instead of turning to God, who's standing there with his arms wide open, say, I've already bought you, I love you, you're in peace with me, that we turn and we kind of cower from God. And we say, golly, you know, I don't know if I want to face God. And then, and then somebody said, we, you know, sometimes we say, let me see if I can stack up some good conduct chips so I can turn back around to God. You know, that, we, we don't have to do that. We have peace with God. And I, I heard a prayer last week, and, and a lady used these two words. He was, and she thanked God for His relentless grace. You know, he pursued us. He pursues us. And we're in this peace with him. So we go back to, yeah, how do we come to grips with the relief to, with living in this peace? Well, it, you know, it should be easier, right? But it's, again, it's one of those things that's simple, but it's not easy. But it's important that we grasp it. Now, another benefit we enjoy is what it says here in verse 2. Access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So it's not just the, the initial, the, the amazing grace that God demonstrated 
to us by saving us through Jesus' death on the cross, but it's this continuing state of grace in which we live. God's free giving to us, it did not end when we became Christians. He continues to pour out His grace on us so much so that we can be said to live in this constant state of grace. And looking forward, Romans 6.14 says, for sin, no lo- for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Yeah, yeah, praise God. We have to soak that in. The next result uh, Paul talks about here of our, of our new justified state is that we boast, or some translations say we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You know, Paul is talking about the hope that we Christians have to share in God's glory. You know, soak that in. In other words, we take confidence and we bask in knowing that at the end of this life, we will enter into the very presence of God. That is heaven. No, no more, as it says, no more tears, no more sorrow, that we will be in, in His presence, face to face with Jesus Christ. And that we get to boast or glory in that hope and the glory of God. But now, in verses 3 through 4, Paul, he takes this, uh, a surprising turn here. He's talking about we're going to have this glory with God. And he says, but we also glory in or we rejoice in our sufferings. You know, having ministered for so many years as he has at this point when he wrote this letter to Romans, Paul knows that those in Rome that hear about these promised blessings, they may have a couple of different reactions. Uh, now some may think, well, if, if, okay, if I give my life to Jesus like you're talking about and I have these blessings that life's just going to be worry-free. You know, no more troubles. Others who've been Christians long enough to know that, well, no, sufferings don't stop. Pr- troubles don't stop in this life. Say, so, well, I might think, well, Paul, you know, maybe this is kind of a pipe dream that you've got about this peace with God that you're talking about. So Paul takes the offensive here in verses 3 and 4. He says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. So yes, Paul says in effect that we know Christians will continue to suffer in this sin-filled world. And maybe even more so, and promises, the word promises, more so because we are Christians. But life's difficulties do not contradict what Paul has been saying about the wonderful blessings enjoyed by Christians. In fact, God uses them to bring us even greater blessings. And the key is how we respond to life's troubles. God, as we know and we study, will study more in Romans uses our troubles for our good. You got to remember that God's plan for us is to mature us spiritually so we become more like Jesus and in so doing that we grow closer to God. We grow closer to Him and His peace and that's where we want to be. That's the goal. So God is using the suffering life for our good to produce, it says, first of all, perseverance. I can make it through this. I've got this hope. I don't have to, I see a a suffering, I don't stop like a brick wall, right? It doesn't stop us. We know we have hope, so we have perseverance, which it says in turn produces characters for the next trials, for us to be able to help others when they face trials, this character that we start building, that God starts building in us. And then we have character through faith, then we have hope. And when we have hope, as we know, we can face anything that this world wants to throw at us because we know our Savior has overcome this world. That is hope. We can overcome anything. You know, and, we, and we remember Jesus said in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. It says with an exclamation point. I have overcome this world. I got to admit, sometimes I wish that I could mature like I need to in my faith without suffering. (laughs) But I know it's not the way that I'm made, and I know that when I face tough times, 
that forces me to my knees, that draws me to turn to God, and then I get to enjoy the blessings that God gives me. And then I mature, and then I grow, and then I start learning more about how much God loves me, and it soaks in. Uh, now it's also important to note here that Paul specifically says, and I heard it said in a class I visited, that we rejoice or glory in our suffering, but, but not because of it. You know, it's taking it too far. We don't, we don't praise God for, hey, thank you, God, for bringing evil into my life. You know, bad things, God despises evil and bad things. And one day he will eliminate all of those from this world, right? Uh, but while we're here, Paul calls us to glory or rejoice in the midst of these afflictions and maybe even because of them. But he does not ask us to be joyful about God bringing me problems. And so that's a good, a good line of distinction to, to note. And here on a related note, I, I, I never want to miss this. Once believers receive God's grace through faith in Christ, we have, as we said at the beginning, peace with God. If we're at peace with God, then we can rest in the knowledge that there is no circumstance God is bringing as a punishment to us. There is no event that's an expression of ill will from God towards us because we are at peace with God. God loves us. So on the contrary from that, God has promised to use every circumstance, whether it's pleasant, whether it's not, whether it's painful, whether it's joyful, to guide his people towards maturity in our relationship with him. And closer to him, again, is where we want to be. The principle we've got up on the board already is that through Christ, we enjoy peace with God in all circumstances. Through Christ, we enjoy peace with God in all circumstances. Do you have peace with God? Have you accepted peace with God that He gives us through Christ? And how, how, how should I react differently in suffering when I'm confronted with problems? How should I react differently, think differently to find glory and trusting God's plan in my life? Now the second division, verses 5 through 8 called hope from God's love. Now Paul is focusing on this aspect of hope that will dominate really the rest of this paragraph. And now what he's talking about is the certainty that believers will receive what they hope for. Hope that does not, hope that will not put us to shame. So we, we ask here this hope, you know, is this just kind of a hope and a prayer like they say, like the song? How can we be sure, talking about hope as in certainty, how do I know that God loves me that much? Well, here we've got it. God's love for us in Christ, He's already proven. It. it has been proven, past tense. God, you know, and God does not, He does not mete out His love for us in bits and pieces. And we get to read here, it says that God poured out His love into our hearts, poured it out. And by pouring out, now here Paul is also, he's alluding back to, to Pentecost in, in Acts chapter 2. And that's where God poured out his spirit into the hearts of all of these new believers like he does us. And it said there that God said, and quoting the scripture, I will pour out my spirit on my people. So Paul here can be talking about the Holy Spirit poured into us, indwelling in our hearts. It's that Holy Spirit that communicates to us from within how much God loves us. And there's more to come, uh, especially in chapter 8, about the work of the Holy Spirit. So, but for now, alongside what we would call this subjective evidence of God's love with His Holy Spirit, we have objective proof that came through Christ on the cross. By sending His Son to die for, and it says, the ungodly, people who refuse to worship Him, that is us, you and me, before we accepted him. God proved his love for us on the cross. How can we be sure? Because he's, I say it again, he proved it on the cross. And to make sure that we don't miss this point now, Paul comes up with this analogy in verse 7 where he says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. 
You know, and here I think maybe the distinction between righteous and good person, if you're righteous, maybe it's someone you respect, but it's a good person, maybe it's just someone that you really love. You know, who would you be willing to die for? Maybe it's your best friend, a, a, a fellow soldier in battle, you know, a, a, a child of yours. That we might be willing, okay, I can see maybe die. God died for every one of us, not when we were the, one of the single most people that we love the most, but the entire planet when we were opposed to him. That's how much he loves us. And so, and he says it in the kicker here in verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That awesome quality of God's love for us is seen in, in, in this act by cross while we're still sinners, hating God. And that means there was definitely, that means there was definitely nothing that we did to earn God's love. We were, in effect, hating God when he saved us. So he did it while we hated him. So now you talk about guaranteeing he has proven, is our hope secure that he loves us that much? He proved it that much. So we have this principle that believers' hope in God is certain because he already proved his love for us. Believers hope in God is certain because he already proved his love for us. You know, this question 9 in the lesson said, you know, explain the difference between Christianity and other religions. And I just throw this in here. Somebody said it uh, Saturday morning. The difference but Christianity being the done religion versus other do religions. It's a done religion because it has been done by God for us as opposed to us having to do something that we couldn't do if we wanted to anyway. Uh, it's a beautiful explanation. All right, so now we get into the third division, last one, verses 9 through 11, of called Life in Christ. And here Paul is really suggesting we can be absolutely confident that God will do what, in a sense, is an easier thing. He's going to deliver from wrath people whom God has already bought to himself. He's already bought us. And so now going forward when we say, now what? God's going to do so, something that really you would think might even be easier. Obviously nothing is impossible for God. And, and Paul mentions here justified and reconciled. And, and, and we know, we've studied already what those means. Justified is, is a legal declaration of our innocence that we don't have to pay for our just punishment for our sin, and that reconciled that he has removed this uh, hostility that existed between us and God because of our sin. And he says here, Paul, he, he seems to say that being saved comes after justification and reconciliation. And this, this, this may seem unusual. You know, we tend to say, we talk about, that was when we were saved. I was saved back in 1983 at summer camp, for example. But Paul, and he does use that word sometimes in that same way, but more often he uses it to depict the believer's final deliverance from death and the wrath of God on the day of judgment. But regardless, being justified and reconciled to God is the critical step to our way to salvation. If those are in place, our eternal salvation is guaranteed. And then you look at how Paul closes out this paragraph in, uh, in verse 11. He talks about how we can rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And we've now received it. So in Jewish theology, back in the day, justification and its opposite condemnation those were verdicts that would only be delivered on the final day of judgment. So now Paul's claim that a person can be justified when he says, now receive reconciliation, that's a radical departure from Jewish thinking of the day. And it really goes to the heart of this whole section of Scripture. If we can be justified now in the present tense, then that necessarily means that we can be certain now. We've give, been given this certainty, which gives us security now which gives us hope now, which gives us peace now with God. And my friends, that is something that is worth boasting about in God. You know, when he finishes out here, by the way, talking about boasting in God through Christ, 
You know, you, you stop for a second. Wait a minute. We're in the Bible. We're not supposed to be boasting. We just talked about not boasting. Right? But if we're boasting in God through Christ, we're necessarily saying have to because we've already been through. Am I there yet? Yes, I got to the point. I need a Savior because I'm a sinner. So when we're boasting in God through Christ, we're boasting about God, and that's words of praise. Uh, and last, and I'm going to tell you guys, this is one of my favorite parts about this whole section, verse 10, when he says, Who, much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So we know that right now that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God on the throne, it says, interceding for us as we speak through this life, and that we have his Holy Spirit in us. So that's why I put down the principle, salvation and life in Christ they only just begin when we accept Him. They only just begin when we accept Him. Now, you guys, you always you finish the lesson with the six-day question. What have you learned about God, and how can we pray for you to make it uh, a truth known to you in your life? And this section, these 11 verses, I'm going to finish with this. How can we make the truths of these 11 verses come alive in our lives? How can we make those truths real in our life, accepting this great relief we have through peace in God. Let us pray. Father God, we cannot thank you enough for what you have done for us, Lord, for what you did for us on the cross, for what you continue to do for us every day. We thank you for the peace that we have in you, present tense, Lord, and we pray for each of the men in here that tomorrow morning, Tuesday, Lord, and every day thereafter, that we wake up and appreciate and accept the peace that we have with you so that we can live with the power that you put in our lives, Lord, through your, through your grace, through your amazing grace, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.